Here are seven things that Starfield needs in order to be good. What's up guys, Acer Thorn here, and my channel was originally dedicated primarily, not exclusively, but primarily to Elder Scrolls and Fallout content. I've been doing a hiatus on that stuff, mostly because the well's starting to dry up, I'm starting to run out of topics to talk about. But I do plan to start bringing back the Bethesda games full-time once Starfield gets released. I'm, I'm definitely going to be streaming that game, maybe not on release date. There's a chance that I might need to upgrade my PC. I won't know if I need to upgrade my PC or not until the recommended specs, the official system requirements, come out. Right now, we only have guesses as to what those system requirements are going to be, and oftentimes, the official system requirements don't actually get released until the PC game itself comes out nowadays, so I won't know if I need to upgrade or not until the game is already out. So if I do need to upgrade, it may take a day or two, it may take up to a week before the upgrades come in the mail. So I may not be able to stream it immediately, but even if that isn't the case, I definitely plan to watch videos and streams about the game, get the gist of the story, and start offering my own theories and perspectives on that. I do have a precedent for that. One of the earliest analysis videos that I ever did, a two-part video, on whether or not Joel in The Last of Us was right to stop the operation to create the vaccine. And I even admitted at the beginning of that two-parter that I had never played the game. I literally can't play the game because I don't have a PlayStation. But I did see the supercut of all the game's cutscenes on YouTube, so I did know the story. So if I have to start out doing fan theories based on that, when it Starfield comes out, I will, but it is pretty much a foregone conclusion that I'm going to be talking about Starfield once it comes out and for the foreseeable future thereafter. So with that being said, here are seven things that I believe that Starfield absolutely needs to have in order to be a worthy successor to Skyrim. Number one is morally ambiguous factions. Now, I understand that the main quest is going to be between two factions known as the United Colonies and the Free Star Collective. Unfortunately, we don't know anything about either of those two factions. Pre-release marketing says that they're going to be the two largest factions in the game. Does that mean there's going to be minor ones? I would certainly hope so. However, I definitely want to point this out, that at least when it comes to the Elder Scrolls games, you really don't have a good track record of the main quest having very deep factions. I mean, in the main quests for most of these games, for the Elder Scrolls games at least, and also for Fallout 3 as well, it's uh, pretty much a cut and dry case as to who the good guys are, and that's the faction the player is shuttled into. You're working with the Blades to stop Dagother, you're working with the Blades to stop Maroon Stagon, and uh, then you're working with the Greybeards and, and then the Blades. Gee, I'm start I, I swear, I didn't notice that pattern until just now. You're always working with the Blades in the main quest, like, what the fuck? Anyway, you're working with the Blades in Skyrim to stop Alduin. But in all these games, as I pointed out in my last Elder Scrolls video, the villains of this game are really just, uh, it, uh, they really are just one-dimensional bad guys. Fallout 4 was the first game developed by Bethesda that really took a serious crack at having morally ambiguous factions in the main quest. Like, there's no right or wrong answer here. You could make a case for nearly any faction being the best hope for rebuilding the Commonwealth. That is what I want to see happen in Starfield. I want the United Colonies and the Free Star Collective to both have their pros and their cons. I want to actually make a choice for myself, and I want it to be a tough one. It's to which side I pick. Number two is multiple diametrically opposed joinable factions. Now this ties in with the first one. 
but it's more of a side issue than it is for the main quest. Like, in the main quests in the Elder Scrolls games, you only had one way to actually do the main quest, aside from Daggerfall, but even then it only really split at the very end. But in Morrowind, the faction quest lines that you could join were... You had multiple factions that you could join. Like, you could join the Mages Guild, or you could join the House Telvanni magic faction. In Oblivion and Skyrim, that was pretty much gutted. You really only had two options, be good or be evil. And if you were good, you joined the Fighters Guild, Mages Guild, Companions, and College of Winterhold. Not that the Companions were the good guys anyway, for reasons I actually made a video about a few years ago. Check that video out for more details. And if you were evil in Oblivion and Skyrim, you pretty much joined the Dark Brotherhood and the Thieves Guild. There was no option to join diametrically opposed factions in Oblivion and Skyrim. Except for the Civil War in Skyrim, which... That, which, I mean, that, and yeah, that's, that's just it. I loved how morally ambiguous that Civil War was, and I want to see more of it. I want there to be factions that you can join and have fully fleshed out quest lines throughout them, independent of the main quest. And more importantly than that, I want those factions to have opposing factions that you could join instead of the other ones that are just as diametrically opposed to each other as the United Colonies and Freestar Collective are. The, uh, the goal of these non-linear RPGs is to let the player play however they want, and sadly the factions in Oblivion and Skyrim just do not cut the mustard in that respect. You really need to give people a choice as to whether they're going to join the highly regulated and highly restricted faction that manages to avoid blowing people up, or are you going to join the faction that gives its members carte blanche, but to hell with who gets hurt in the process? Which one are you going to do? That should be up for the player to decide. In these open world RPGs where the player gets to play however they want, you need to be able to give them options and have those options actually mean something. Speaking of options with meaning, that's number three, branching storylines. I don't mean just like once you've chosen a faction, that's the only time the storyline branches in any way. No, I mean, let's say I'm sent by a faction to do something, and whether or not I complete that task successfully has a drastic a difference, and not just a dialogue difference, but the actual story itself will change radically based on whether I succeeded or failed uh, to uh, uh, to secure that base or whatever. Uh, and up until now, the closest thing we've actually had to um, dra to uh, co to consequences for failure are not actually branching storylines per se they were um if you don't if you fail this quest then you don't get this guy's help in the final battle i'm sorry that's not very interesting like anybody can do that uh actually tell us some sto actually have the story itself change based on what you do at various uh intervals at various pivot moments and that'll give us an opportunity and give us an incentive to play the game multiple times and play the game uh, and intentionally do things differently on subsequent playthroughs because we don't just want to see oh this oh uh, if Boris dies here you he can't uh, fight alongside you when you opening the great gate Boring. Just boring. We already know exactly what that's going to look like, even if we've never actually played that path. It's not at all hard for us to imagine what the Great Gate battle without Boris would look like. It would look exactly the same as it does with Boris, just with one guy short, and a guy that isn't even going to make all that much difference any damn way. No, I mean the story itself should actually uh, change almost completely 
uh, based on a decision you make or a success or failure that you perform. Like, uh, go and actually read some of those old choose-your-own-adventure books and think about how radically the story will change uh, based on what you choose during a... Uh, uh, at a specific point. Uh, like, in one, in one case, you're spending the night in Haunted House because the security guard found you and he's giving you sleeping bags in another, in another, uh, this branch, the, the, there's no security guard, but there is a mummy because the museum really is haunted, and in another branch, you end up going in circles, taking only left turns for the rest of eternity until you realize that the game, that the book is just... Uh, throwing you for a loop. I mean, the game will, the, the books will, the stories will change radically. They, it'll become a completely different story based on choices that don't really matter. That you don't think really matter at all that much. Like, one of the first uh, Choose Your Own Adventure books I ever read was uh, the Goosebumps Choose Your Own Adventure book called Beware the Purple Peanut Butter. And when you ate either the purple peanut butter or some brown cake, you would either grow or shrink. Uh, I think the purple peanut butter uh, made you shrink if you ate it first. But if you ate the cake first, you would start to grow. Um, but then if you went back and ate the purple peanut butter because you thought... Well, I, I read another branch, uh, and that makes me shrink, so maybe that'll cancel out the cake of growth. Uh, you eat the purple peanut butter, and then it makes you grow even faster. Like, th there doesn't need to be any continuity between these branching storylines. Uh, that, in fact, that just keeps the audience on their toes. So yeah, we definitely need branching storylines, both in the main quest and in the side quest lines as well. Number 4, a Minecraft-esque colony and base building system. Now, uh, Bethesda has advertised that there's going to be over a thousand planets, and that these planets are all going to be life-sized. Now, people hear that, and a lot of people are instantly hit with the assumption that it's all just going to be a vast empty space rather than anything interesting being done with it. And much to my surprise, Don Howard even admitted, uh... Yeah, there's going to be plenty of planets that are just barren wastelands that really serve no purpose other than just to be strip mined for resources or to allow open spaces for modders to set up their own content without obstructing the main stuff. Uh, yeah, he admits that that's really all that these extra planets are going to be good for in terms of actual gameplay. Well, if you're just going to let me strip mine them for resources and that's all they're there for without mods, well then... Uh, there needs to be something compelling that I can actually do with these resources. Uh, and in Fallout 4, your settlement building system was actually quite robust by Bethesda standards. Um, Minecraft was a... I mean, I mean, to be fair, it's not fair to compare it to Minecraft because... And for that game, the whole point of the game is getting as much resources as you can and then building the biggest shit ever. Uh, but really, though, that is the ideal you should strive for. If there's going to be literal whole full-sized planets worth of raw materials that you can mine, uh, that's going to be a lot of materials. And the only thing I can think of, unless you've got something really creative up your ass, is that could actually put all of those resources to use is the ability to build the either the castle of your dreams or the space colony of your dreams. Co a colony capable of realistically supporting thousands of NPCs and for there to actually be uh, living spaces, jobs, and, uh, ser and, and, and food and services uh, to support a population of literally thousands of them. Or just the mother of all personal player homes that just store that's just like the that rivals the Taj Mahal in terms of grandioseness. 
Um, if you, I mean, and we should really only be limited by two things, our imagination and the amount of RAM our computers have to be able to load all of this stuff. Uh, I mean, you're really going to need to go all in with these, um, with the resources if you're going to, um, give us all of these resources, if you're going to give us all of these resources to play with, you really need to go all in in giving us near complete creative freedom to build absolutely massive stuff with these resources. Number five, and this is where we're going to be diving headfirst into the uh, gameplay section of this game, uh, is good puzzles in the dungeons. Uh, Skyrim's puzzles in their dungeons were absolutely pathetic. Uh, you, they literally, you literally just gave them the answers in plain sight. And there's absolutely no uh, challenge to them, literally whatsoever. Uh, are you afraid that if you made the puzzles too too difficult to solve, that uh, players wouldn't might get stuck on them? Because you know that's what online guides are for, right? I mean, there's there's absolutely no excuse. I mean, at the very least, uh, keep the puzzles as a part of optional dungeons, and then if you do include a puzzle in a mandatory dungeon, give us an alternate path where we can just brute force our way through. Uh, alternate paths are always a good thing. You can never go wrong with giving alternate paths anyway. Um, but really though, I cannot stress this enough, Bethesda. In Skyrim, your puzzles absolutely sucked, and What's worse is that you actually, instead of just admitting that you fucked up, you published an in-game book uh, where you tried to give the in-universe explanation that uh, the puzzles are so simple because they aren't designed to keep adventurers out, they're designed to keep the draugr in. But that doesn't, that does, that's ridiculous. I mean, as soon as you, like, you literally show people either getting killed or having al or already being dead at the p because they can't figure out the puzzle so this is clearly meant to be a brain bender in universe and yet it's the simplest shit it, that even a child could figure out like <sighs> look th this is this really uh, you suck with puzzles Hire a guy, at least one guy, who actually is good at designing dungeon puzzles, and ha and then just, uh, whenever you're making the dungeons, just have a separate section of the dungeon that, that remains un- that just is just a big old blank slate with a door at the end, and then tell the d puzzle guy that he needs to use the space provided to craft a puzzle that'll be used to open that door. The and then just let him go buck wild. That's the best solution I can think of, since uh, those who are all who worked on Skyrim clearly have no fucking idea how to do even the simplest of puzzles. Well, no, they do have an idea how to do the simplest puzzles, and that's the problem. That's all they can do is literally the simplest of puzzles. Number six, NPCs who all matter. Now, earlier I said that the factions, need, there needed to be multiple factions, and they all needed to have their pros and cons. Uh, I didn't want there to be any actual throwaway factions, but here I understand that you, that, mm, you can't really give every NPC a major character status. There are some NPCs, I mean, especially if you're doing thousands of NPCs, there are some NPCs who simply aren't going to be all that interesting, and that's simply inevitable. However, you can still have the NPCs have some sort of impact on the world. Um, if an NPC dies for any reason, then he obviously can't go to his job anymore, which means that company is now going to be a man down, which means their productivity is going to uh, decrease for the for, for the a little bit until they 
until maybe 10 in-game days later when some new generic NPC gets conjured up insert, and then just gets added to the game world to serve as that guy's replacement. But for those 10 in-game days, the company's productivity is reduced because of their staff shortages. And uh, then everybody else who uses that company's products uh, has to adjust to has to adjust their own style lifestyles uh, temporarily because they don't have access to the to as many of the products anymore. Uh, individual NPCs can have a butterfly effect uh, that can end up rocking the game. Uh, obviously, you don't want the whole game to just come tumbling down like a Jenga tower if one NPC gets taken out of the equation. Uh, but you really do, you really can just have NPCs who are there to do more than just take up space. I don't want it to be like Diamond City where uh, so many, where there was like three-fourths of the people there were just called Saddler, and the only people who actually had names were either merchants or quest NPCs. You absolutely can't... Uh, now, I don't want to be like Morrowind, where even the bandits have unique names. No, we don't need that. But the people who are in the cities, who are peaceful, they need to have unique names, and they need to have at least some de minimis effect uh, in the cities that they inhabit. It would help uh, to sell the idea that this is a living, breathing world. If there's just somebody standing in his house 24-7, never saying anything, never doing anything, and doesn't even seem to have a job, and I can just kill him and start using his house as a base, and nobody else in the game seems to even notice or care, that kind of breaks the illusion for me. So... Yeah, we need to have our our actions need to have consequences, and the best way to do that is to ensure that all NPCs are one are are all part of a society. And number seven is backgrounds that matter. Now, when we're doing our character creation, we are give I understand that we're going to be given the option of having several professional backgrounds. Uh. That's going to dictate our starting stats and whatnot, and maybe even a few of the lines of dialogue in the opening quest, the tutorial quest. Uh, but frankly, in my opinion, that's not enough. Um, if we were a former soldier, for instance, in the uh, Freestyle Collective, or Free Star Collective, sorry, uh, we should be... That should be... We should be deferred to as a former soldier uh, for the entire main quest because that's how the people in the Free Star Collective would have seen us. If we um, and our individual backgrounds should also have unique dialogue options that'll allow us to use our previous experiences in order to shortcut or bypass various sections of the uh, main quest or even faction quest lines. Uh, because of our past experiences and our past connections, we're able to exploit those in order to gain an advantage. Um, not all shortcuts or bypasses should be created equal, though. Like, I would like it if there was a definitive background that we should that speedrunners should select, uh, because it'll allow them to bypass the most amount of minutes in the main quest in order to optimize their any percent runs. Um, others, like, and, and, and not just speedruns either, as far as minutes played is concerned, no, not, in addition to that, how about bypassing sections of the main quest that, uh, would have been exceptionally difficult, not just from an RPG standpoint, but from a, uh, player reaction time standpoint. Um, like, it has the potential to, um, to be very, like, it re requires precise aiming and timing or maybe it would it has the potential to cause a lot of uh, unimportant characters to die which would lead to the aforementioned butterfly effects 
So if you so if you have the option to bypass that using one of your backgrounds, then that would obviously be beneficial. Like I don't like make it so that there's really uh, uh, a strategic choice to be made when you select your background, other than uh, what skills do you want to start? So anyway, those are the seven things that I believe Starfield needs uh, in order to be a good game. Uh, this, th this game has been described by Todd Howard as Skyrim in space, uh, and so it is directly inviting comparisons to Skyrim, and if it's going to live up to that legacy, uh, those are the seven things that I think it needs in order to be a worthy successor to Skyrim. So, with that being said, I am Acer Thorin, and I will see you guys next time. Peace!